and welcome to another episode of FeatherCast, the voice of the Apache Software Foundation. I am Rich Bowen, and today I have with me Roman Shaposhnik, who is our VP of Legal Affairs. Uh, he's he's worn a number of other hats at the at the foundation over the years, but that's the capacity that I'm currently doing this interview in. And so, thank you very much for for taking time to speak with me. Well, thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. So let's start with just in introductions here. Who are you and, and why are you in this role? How have you come to this role? That is indeed a very good question because as uh, I am typically pointing out uh, immediately, I'm not a officially you know, trained, licensed you know, lawyer. Uh, I'm not licensed in any jurisdiction, maybe aside from, you know, Twitter jurisdiction. I have a lot of opinions, you know, including legal ones, but none of them are binding. So uh, to your point, it's kind of weird because, you know, for me, just being a developer who has been contributing to a lot of the ASF projects hands-on over the years, all of a sudden to end up on the Apache Legal Committee. And by the way, it's not just me, right? You know, just like everything in Apache. Uh, I'm just helping a good bunch of people, you know, do all of this work and, you know, coordinating it, sort of representing it back to the board. Uh, but all of the good work is done uh, by a whole bunch of really awesome uh, volunteers who are collectively known as legal committee. So in a way, none of us are lawyers. I am not a lawyer. And yet we're trying to help ASF as much as we can to stay away, you know, uh, from trouble, legal and otherwise. And, and what does that mean, stay away from trouble? I mean, the ASF is a well-known, well-respected organization. Any company would be crazy to, to take us to court. It would damage their reputation. What, what sort of scenarios does the legal committee actually deal with in real life? That's actually a really good question because I think that's how people typically misunderstood what we do You know, here at ASF on the legal committee at least. Uh, because they always map ASF corporate structure to a traditional corporate structure, right? And obviously, in a traditional corporate structure, a legal counsel is uh, very much in business of, you know, providing uh, advice on matters that can be uh, very much related to the business at hand. So there is a lot of potential litigation, you know, going on. There is, you know, constant risk assessment going on. We're not really involved in much of that. Uh, a typical function or a typical set of functions that we do, I would split them into buckets. One is external and the other one is internal. So I will start with an internal one. So as you know uh, better than I do, you know, ASF is basically a steward of the Apache software license. And as licenses go, being legal documents, it is actually a living, breathing document uh, that constantly needs to be uh, interpreted by people and not that we provide that interpretation, but we basically help our developers understand what are they signing up when they sign up for the Apache license or one of the derivatives uh, of the Apache license, which would be uh, CCLA or ICLA, just helping them understand the you know, terms and conditions. Because believe it or not, a lot of times developers are just completely unaware that there is any legal uh, framework put in place by the foundation. They just kind of blindly accept, you know, CCLAs and ICLAs, not thinking about it too much and constantly reminding them that there is a lot of uh, background thought that needs to be put into how you accept new contributions. What do you do yourself? You're sort of bound by these legal documents and helping developers understand what it means is, you know, a big role of what we do. So that's sort of the internal function. And a lot of it is actually amazingly enough done on JIRA. So Apache Legal Committee has its own JIRA. You can actually go, it's a public JIRA. Uh, you can look at the issues on it. Uh, the uh, category is legal. And it's pretty easy to sort of look up and see what we typically deal with. Most of the time it's questions from developers. Hey, you know, we're trying to include this piece of software into the project. What do you think, uh, would it be compatible with an Apache license? Or, you know, we're trying to build this product based on the Apache license, you know, what are the rules that we should look for, you know, and kind of be mindful of, so that, that type of thing. So that's sort of the internal function. Another internal function that we have is helping uh, VP brand and, you know, trademark, defend, you know, trademarks when it comes to actually defending them. Now, again, to your point, good news about ASF is that a company would be crazy to get into a legal tussle with us. So a lot of times a nice reminder from, you know, a VP uh, brand would be enough to sort of settle that issue. 
but sometimes very rarely we actually do get involved in sort of drafting angry letters, you know, in you know, legalese, you know, that would compel the company to do something that they might not otherwise uh, want to do. But most of the time, it absolutely always has to do with improper use of our branding, be it, you know, Apache logo, Apache names, or any of that sort of things. So these are the internal ones. Should I go into the external ones or what, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think the external is interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, when, when would somebody outside the organization interact with you? Yeah, exactly. That's actually how I, so I, I ended up on a legal committee, partially because I used to be on the other side of that process. So in my corporate life, I somehow ended up being in a lot of collaboration with, you know, corporate legal counsel when a company would decide to start participating in the open source in a big way, right? So suppose a company has an internal project, you know, maybe a product even, and they all of a sudden decide that, you know, they need to reap the benefits of a community development and, you know, more of a collaborative style of development. Then of course, you know, the decision becomes, well, we need to donate that piece of code to one of the open source foundations. You know, the list is, you know, the usual suspects is not that long. So ASAP is always on that list. And in all of my corporate life, I ended up helping legal counsels you know, basically deal with foundations like Linux Foundation and ASF to figure out, you know, potential risks and whatnot. And through doing that, I actually realized that Apache has this, you know, wonderful group of people, you know, legal uh, committee that you can engage with being an external legal representative of a corporate entity. And they would actually guide you through some of your questions. You know, they would explain uh, some of the processes, you know, that would be there. So a lot of times companies would engage with us, and now I'm talking, you know, being on the inside, purely because they want to open source something, and it is not quite clear for them, you know, how to do it. So actually a lot of times, used to be more, uh, now it's a little bit less, but it used to be like every month I would be on a call with, you know, somebody from like a big corporation, uh, just explaining to them what does it mean to open source your project, you know, how would transferring the IP into the foundation work, you know, basically all of the mechanics, the kind of like legal types of mechanics that would uh, accompany open source uh, corporate project. So that's a big one. Another big one is obviously, uh, again, to your point, ASF itself, I actually don't know. I mean, you've been at ASF longer than I have, maybe you do, but I don't remember a single time uh, when ASF would be really like ASF itself would be threatened with a, a, a legal action. But Not we do that I get recall. Exactly, exactly. But we do get involved a lot in subpoena business because a lot of times when a third party lawsuit is going on, obviously there cannot be a lawsuit that has to do with software these days without involving open source, right? Because, you know, almost all corporate, you know, closed source and proprietary projects have at least uh, some percentage of open source in them. And typically that open source comes from, you know, well-respected foundations, I said being one of them. So a lot of times we end up on, you know, sort of in subpoena business because there is a certain set of facts, a discovery uh, that a corporate attorney would do to basically represent, you know, his or her client uh, in court in the best possible way. And a lot of times it's just, you know, basically explaining to them that in ASF pretty much everything is open, everything is in, in the public. So I myself don't really help with a lot of that discovery. I just guide them and point them like, hey, you're looking for the information, let's say on a mailing list. Here's our, all the archives of the mailing list, go wild. I mean, it's all indexed, you know, if you're looking for a particular, you know, instance, like go look for it, you know, here. Or, you know, uh, a lot of times I would be pointing them out that, you know, all of the releases of ASF are preserved, you know, for eternity. So if they want them, you know, find, compare, you know, what IP ended up in what release, they're absolutely free to do so. And a lot of times I'm really, it, it, still, it still boggles my mind. It is 2022. I'm still explaining to people what open source is. Sure, yeah. It is, it is amazing, but it is true. And I try to take it in, you know, I try to take it in stride because a lot of times a corporate legal uh, counsel would come to me and just ask very, very basic questions of what software, open source software is, how we develop it, how come, you know, ASF is a nonprofit like super basic questions. So I had one of those is, meetings today. So. Oh, really? You did? So, so then, you're, yeah, then, then you're absolutely well aware. So yeah. I call it education business. I call it like kind of like kindergarten of open source. And we all have to do it, but a lot of it actually falls on the legal committee. Who all is involved in that? And are any of them actually lawyers? Do you ever call in actual 
lawyers into the process? Amazing question. So most of the legal committee members, uh, like what I was explaining about myself, actually end up being just volunteers, you know, from the ASF membership. Uh, typically, we're not trained legal professionals, you know, at least I don't know any of the actual, you know, software developers who also would double as a trained mm -hmm. legal professional. Maybe there are some, I mean, I'm just not aware, but typically we're just developers. Now, it obviously takes a village, you know, to help an organization the size of ASF uh, with everything that I've just described so, uh, you know, so far. So we do get help from uh, legal firms and we do have really good friends and well-established ones. So DLA Piper is a really good friend of ASF and, you know, they helped us, you know, through a lot of different situations. Uh, there are other sort of, you know, legal firms that are helping us typically, uh, People in those firms, you know, give us a certain amount of hours pro bono, which is amazing because again, ASF is a small, you know, relatively speaking software foundation. We don't have like a huge legal budget, uh, but a lot of times, you know, for things that especially get into subpoena business, you know, type of a situation, mm -hmm. uh, we end up footing a little bit of a legal bill, you know, to draft an opinion or clear up the language or basically make sure that the uh, uh, writing that we do as, you know, developers who are just curious about law and know a lot about law, but are not trained legal experts, you know, what we have wrote would stand in court or would even be sort of admissible in court. So we do kind of have a mixture of both. And what's amazing that even professional lawyers, in a way, are volunteering at ASF. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess yeah. it's the magic of ASF, you know, we make everybody volunteer, at least a little bit. Earlier this week, I watched and listened to our president, David Nally, speak before the Senate. Was the legal committee involved in any way in, in preparing his statements? We were absolutely involved in uh, working through the situation that, you know, uh, arised when Log4j vulnerability got published. Uh, typically in ASF, you know, anything that has to do with CVEs and those types of, you know, huge vulnerabilities get through a security group first. Uh, but then, you know, we on the legal committee get involved, especially if there is a potential for additional legal work that may result from it. And in this particular case, I feel like, you know, the hornet nest has been kicked enough uh, so that the governments get involved, you know, uh, private corporate entities get involved. Uh, so it was more of a heads up for us, you know, we reviewed a few uh, potential, you know, ways of addressing an immediate concern when the vulnerability got published and the ASF response got published. David's uh, statement in its entirety uh, wasn't really reviewed in any sense, but, you know, okay. given that he's a very trusted member of the uh, Apache sort of executive team, I mean, there was no need for that, but typically our directors, you know, know when to come to us. And a lot of times mm -hmm. they would come to us ahead of time and ask like, hey, what's, what, what do you think, you know, should we say this or that? But I think, you know, David's example was a really great example of what value ASF provides, right? Yes, we're a completely ragtag group of volunteers, but when, you know, when we're called, there's actually always somebody to pick up that proverbial phone, right? And, you know, David actually being there in a, in a testifying in the Senate, in the official capacity, I think is a good example of why ASF is so valuable, because at the end of the day, uh, the buck stops with us, you know, with directors uh, and uh, whoever wants to get, you know, to, to any kind of like to the bottom of any kind of situation actually gets uh, somebody from the ASF to work with them. One of the big advantages of having a project in a foundation like Apache is that I don't have to care about all this stuff, right? I mean, is there is there any sense that I, as a developer on an Apache project, need to care about what you do? I think you do. And I think, you know, it kind of comes in two different categories. First of all, uh, when you join ASF uh, as an individual, you are signing a legal document with us. That legal document is called ICLA, you know, Individual Contributor License Agreement. And it actually stipulates a few things that just like any legal document, I mean, you really should read it carefully before you sign it, because you're effectively signing up for certain things, like let's say making sure that your contributions are yours, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that you understand what it is for you to license out your contribution, right? So you don't, you know, uh, complain later on. So understanding those things is very useful. And I would say not just ASF, but any project, any foundation a developer contributes to, uh, you really should understand it. Good news is with ASF, you can talk to a legal committee, uh, you can talk to myself and we can try to guide you and explain you, you know, what it means, right? 
Now, once you become especially a committer on an Apache project, you sort of like the bar of responsibility raises a little bit because Apache is super paranoid about IP provenance. We really track every single line of code, where it came from. We can attribute it back to you. And what it means is now you are on the hook uh, talking to people who are contributing code, not being committers to basically explain all of that to them. So now you sort of graduated from a student to a teacher, right? Because like a random person who just contributed, you know, a huge patch, you look through it and you see copyright statements, you know, from weird places. As a committer, it is now your job to make sure that you work with that contributor who is not a committer to basically clear up any kind of confusion that may be there about, you know, where that IP came from. So you sort of become a steward of a project, right? And especially the bar gets kicked up a notch. If you join a PMC, then, you know, that is even higher level of responsibility. And all through that progression, you kind of increase the level of exposure to the legal side of the ASF. So to answer your question, I guess if you just have what I call them drive-by contributor, and I don't mean mm -hmm. a derogatory, right? You know, sure. I mean, like people sometimes, you know, have a very small issue to fix. They just, just send you a patch. Sometimes they wouldn't even follow through a Jira or any kind of formal process. They're like, here's the patch, you know, on the mailing list, do whatever you want with it, right? Like probably those types of people don't really have to care about, you know, legal implications. But anybody who is officially associated with ASF, I think they kind of do it, just, you know, different spectrum of how much you should care. So I think you've, you've, uh, you've clearly articulated how your committee helps the foundation itself. Tell us a little bit about how that benefits um, end users, downstream consumers, customers, corporations, and so on that rely on what we do. Interestingly enough, it is all about reputation. So ASF, not just because of legal committee, but just because of our absolute uh, paranoid uh, focus on IP and IP provenance has basically built a reputation of a safe place to take software from. Now, again, it doesn't mean that we don't really uh, run into, you know, tricky situations from time to time. And, you know, every single corporate entity I've ever been at uh, basically runs their product through, you know, scanners like mm -hmm. Black Duck or Palamida or, you know, any kind of formal scanners. And sometimes, you know, they uncover things, you know, that we could have done better. But inevitably, you know, with pretty much like 100%, you know, accuracy, Every single company I've been at, and I've been at companies as big as EMC, right? You know, it's like really huge companies. Pretty much every single time, the scan result from all of the software that comes from ASF comes clean. ASF is basically known for producing one of the cleanest, you know, software in terms of IP management that, you know, you could possibly imagine. And to me, that is one of the biggest values that we provide to the downstream consumers, especially if those consumers can happen to be corporate entities because they perceive us as the safe heaven, as the safe place to take the software from. Now, again, you could look at it and say like, well, but Roman, they do it because our software is awesome. True, it is. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they also do it because it is safe. So uh, basically given a choice between a library that is a random project on GitHub and a library that is, you know, maintained and, you know, checked by the ASF, inevitably it will be the ASF library that, you know, takes precedence. Even if the functionality is slightly less compelling, uh, the reputation that we have built is really huge value that we'll provide to the downstream consumers. Now, I probably signed my ICLA in 1996 um, because that's sure what you did. you did. It's what you mm -hmm. did at the time. You just signed it. And, and there wasn't much question as to whether that was a good thing. But, but the, the conversation in the software industry in the last few years has been overwhelmingly anti-CLA. While I hear some people saying, well, Apache is an exception, there's, there's still this anti-CLA uh, conversation going on. So what's your thought on this? A, a CLA, DCO, uh, nothing, um, trust people, keep your own copyright. What, what, what's your take on this conversation? Really good question. And uh, it goes without saying that, you know, all of my opinions here on this, you know, podcast are just my opinions. But sure. in this particular case, it goes doubly so. So like what I'm about to say is purely my opinion. You know, I'm not wearing any official hat, but nonetheless, here it is. So I'll start with, you know, where I would give those people, uh, you know, like I would, I would give them a point. 
I think anybody who is pointing out to us that CCLAs, corporate CLAs are redundant, uh, they probably have a point. And we are basically, we have them more out of, out of a habit mm -hmm. and a little bit, you know, belt and suspenders type of a strategy. Like they don't really hurt us. And even if they're a little bit complex and convoluted and, you know, require additional legal handling, they actually don't even hurt developers because CCLAs are something that a corporate legal representative would sign. And honestly, I mean, I'm not in business of optimizing, you know, for that constituency. I'm much more in business of optimizing, you know, for uh, developers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. even if it creates a little bit more friction on the corporate legal side, I'm sort of okay with that, right? Again, just personally, just maybe as a developer, right? So CCLAs, I could, I could see the point that they may be redundant. Whether we would ever get rid of them, I mean, I've seen a number of uh, conversations on the Apache Legal Committee, you know, to maybe officially sort of uh, stop using them or whatever. Every single time I have the discussion, I go like, yeah, we should probably do that. And inevitably next month or a few months later, somebody from a corporate world comes to me with, you know, subpoena, you know, subpoena related activity. And that is exactly where CCLAs become truly useful. Because okay. CCLA then becomes a clear statement from a corporate entity that they knew exactly what was going on. It wasn't up to individual developers. It was the corporate entity that knew what it meant to contribute software to the Apache Software Foundation. No ifs or buts. So that actually makes uh, a legal case much clearer in, in that particular respect. So they do play their role. They're not really uh, required. I think you can establish the same sort of uh, set of facts, even with ICLAs, you don't have to use it, the CCLA, but they make your life slightly easier if you ever end up on the receiving end of a subpoena. Now we come to the true, you know, VI versus Emacs, you know, type of a discussion, right? You know, ICLAs versus DCO. DCO, by the way, stands for uh, Developer Certificate of Origin. DCO started in a Linux ecosystem, right? Linux kernel to be specific yeah. ecosystem. And now I'm about to make my most inflammatory and contradictory, contradictory statement, which is, I think Linux kernel was sort of mismanaged from the IP management perspective to begin with, simply because it was one dude's project, right? Nobody expected it to grow as big as it did. So once it did, the question then became like, what do we do about all of those contributions that on one hand were done under the guidance of the inbound license, you know, equals outbound license, which is, you know, GPL in that particular case. So the implicit assumption was that everybody who was contributing to the Linux kernel was contributing under the GPL, right? You know, that was sort of the, uh, the, the inbound license. But that's just an assumption. I think the DCO basically grew out of a, a essentially a problem that ASF has never had, which is we track the provenance of our IP from the day one, Linux kernel didn't. Now, in inventing DCO and convincing the legal universe, you know, the legal sort of constituency that DCO is, you know, it can stand in court, you know, I think they sort of leapfrog the whole discussion and basically say like, well, we sort of like, we had a problem, we saw an opportunity, and instead of complaining about the problem, we actually came up with an amazing tool to not just fix the problem, but basically make every developer's life much easier. That actually may be true, but I think the origins of DCO are rooted in a problem. So now back to Apache, we don't have the problem. So should we accept the DCO just because it makes developers life, you know, allegedly easier? You know what? I actually don't think so. I think, you know, in a way, signing an ICLA is an explicit act that anybody who is at least on the committed, you know, list, let alone PMC, should take as a statement of intent, right? Mm -hmm. It is sort of on purpose, right? You know, we want people to go like, ha, huh, I'm signing something. Maybe I am actually now responsible for more than just, you know, being a good software developer. So, and again, this is, I know this is controversial. I know a lot of people say like, well, but what about random developers who don't want to sign yeah. anything? I get all of that, but I think people who are really committed to the project, you know, hence the names committers, I actually don't think it's because you can commit to the project It's because you're committed to the project, you know, then you become a committer, but people who are committed to the project and the PMC, I see a lot of value, like a psychological value in signing an ICLA. So that's, that's my answer. 
All right. And on that controversial note, I, I think we're we're just about done. Did, did you have anything else that I didn't ask that you wanted to uh, to bring to our listeners' attention? I just want to say that, and again, this may sound like a strange statement coming from a developer guy. A legal world can be a lot of fun. And you should, I mean, you should try it for yourself. And again, the good news about ASF is that it gives you all of these amazing opportunities to expose yourself to different, you know, kind of aspects of what it takes to produce a piece of software. So just sign up, you know, for our legal mailing list. You know, uh, there is one that is open and, you know, anybody is welcome to sign up. You can br browse our archives. Uh, go in, take a look at our JIRA, participate, uh, especially if you're a trained legal professional, you know, if you can give us some of your time pro bono, that would be even more amazing. But even if you're just a developer, just try it out, see what we discuss, you know, maybe you will get fascinated. I'll give you one, uh, one of my personal stories. One of my moments where I went, aha, legal is a lot of fun, was actually when I was kind of discussing uh, what would it take to give a piece of software to the ASF. And the question that, you know, a legal uh, counsel had for me was, well, but we don't want it to pre-open source that piece of software. Effectively, what they wanted to achieve is that piece of software would be either open source as an ASF project or it wouldn't be open sourced at all. And we actually had to come up with this really elaborate scheme that sort of reminds me now of smart contracts where we would effectively calculate a hash sum on the tarball uh, that would then be given to the ASF, but we would only put that hash sum into a legal document, basically saying, if all parties agree, you know, then the content of the tarball that hashes to that hash sum would be given to the ASF as the initial code donation. <laughs> and sort of developing that with the, you know, actual trained lawyer, kind of like, you know, whiteboarding and, you know, brainstorming and coming up with that final solution was when I was like, that is amazing. I mean, legal profession can be a lot of fun. So join in, you know, uh, and try it out for yourself at ASF. Thank you, Roman. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you all for listening to Feathercast. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.